Um, so I will introduce our next panel, Diversity in PR to PC or not to PC. So this panel will be moderate, moderated by April Boykin Hutchko from Effect, uh, with Amelia Folks from State Farm, Brandy Boatner from IBM, and AJ Wal Walton from change.org. We'll let you take it away, April. All right. Thanks so much, Megan. Yes, as Megan mentioned, we are going to be examining really our industry and the efforts that it's been doing in recruiting and retaining diverse minority talent. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to introduce a little bit further our three amazing panelists, <laughs> um, including first up we have, oops, dropping note cards already, we have Brandy Boatner. <laughs> Welcome, Brandy. She is a social and influencer communications lead at IBM. Uh, she identifies how IBM and global influencers drive engagement around strategic communication plays, including uh, AI, blockchain, and uh, uh, cybersecurity. And as an advocate for diversity and inclusion, she serves as a member for IBM's Marketing Communications Diversity and Inclusion Council. She's also chair of IBM's, Mark, uh, IBM's Black Network New York of New York Business Resources Group. And she's also advisory council member of La Grant Foundation. These are very important things. She's also very, very um, involved in our circuit for PR, obviously. She is a former board of directors for PRSA Foundation. And she's current co-chair of the Social Media Committee of National PRSA Technology Section. Welcome. All right, <laughs> thank you. And then we also have Amelia, who's next. Amelia Folks from uh, State Farm. She's our, their PR brand strategist, and she comes with 15 years of experience in the field, and she has great expertise in corporate social responsibility, multi multicultural markets, um, economic empowerment for minority communities, and she currently serves as Austin PRSA's uh, diversity chair, and she's the incoming president-elect. So welcome, Amelia. And last and certainly not least, we have AJ Walton. He's the Senior Communications Manager at Change.org. He's partnered with celebrities, MTV, uh, ACLU, GLAAD, and uh, lawmakers, all to amplify stories of social change. Um, and this is all in the name of driving change people seek in their communities across the globe. Um, just a quick fun facts that I know AJ wanted me to share with you guys is that he's a self-avowed mama's boy and <laughs> he's an all-knower of everything Whitney Houston. <laughs> so we will challenge him on those things. But um, so let's get to the topic, diversity, right? So diversity is in the fiber of our flag, right? But it's not always given opportunity to succeed. Um, and sometimes it's often at the crux <laughs> of controversy. Just think about the Dove campaign snafu that happened last week. Is everybody familiar with that? Yes. <laughs> so um, to kick things off, let's just really kind of dig down into it. What does diversity mean for our industry? Anyone can take it, you guys. So I actually did some uh, research in the stats. I'm kind of a research wonk. I love doing research. but. I wanted to just start us off with an understanding of where we are as an industry, and I will tell you, we have a long way to go. So you guys are now our change makers. So let's go, let's be empowered. But just so you have an idea, 70% of women um, are in the PR industry, but only 30% in the executive ranks. Um, African Americans make up 10.3% of our industry, Asians 5.4, and Hispanics 3.3. That's pretty dismal. And if you look at population census data, population growth for 2015, Latino and Asian immigrants. But we're at the bottom of the tier. So we have a lot of work to do. And then one in seven infants in 2015, this was two years ago, were born multiracial or multi-ethnic. And our spending power is 3.6 trillion by 2028. So we are in the communities, but for some reason we're not represented. Yeah, so to add to that, I think diversity looks like the opposite of our current stats. 
Um, so we need to make sure that people who are in leadership are women and people of color and people from the LGBTQ community and that we, the people that we're hiring, the people that we're recruiting, um, don't look like the spaces that we currently um, find ourselves in on a regular basis. And I would even take a step back further. I just read a Forbes article um, about black executives in the Forbes um, 500 or, you know, not the Fortune, but the Forbes one. Um, and there are 15, 15 out of 500. And I'm not really good with math in my head. That's, that's like low. That's like real, like real low. So I'm like, okay, so my chances of being a CEO, maybe not so great, but maybe I'm here to change the game. So that's just kind of the business world at large. If I take a look at PR, and I think PR has a PR problem. You guys have heard that, I'm sure, before, that PR has a PR problem. Um, because I still get, first of all, my family doesn't know what I do still, and it's really interesting. My mom, she like paid for, they paid Unless for college. They paid, right? My parents, you wrote the check, you paid for school. What do you mean you don't know what I do? So there's still this misconception about PR, and maybe some of you have the misconceptions, maybe you do or you don't, but we're not just the party planners, and you know, listen, Samantha on Sex and the City was really fun to watch, but that is not my life. Not real. That is not my life. Um, you know, certain, you know, Jonathan Chebin and kind of the celebrity PR, that's also not my life. Um, and I, I think from a diversity standpoint, we need to look at first educating people as to what it is that we do, that is PR. Then looking at, well, do we show up at some of the top colleges, um, you know, that have PR programs? or high schools for kids who are getting ready to go into college to say, this is what PR really is. Do we go to, you know, underrepresented communities? Or, you know, do, what, what, are we, what are we doing? And I think April will probably ask some questions because there are some things yes. that we are doing as an industry, kind of that tele telepathy we got going on. <laughs> but there are some things that we're doing, but I definitely think not just from the numbers Amelia read, we have a PR problem. Like we have a PR problem. How many people here think that PR is planning parties? It's okay, it's a safe space. If you really feel that way, it's okay, we won't tell anybody. It's safe here. Well, and you do plan parties and events for your clients. One part so of PR. So that's one part of it. How many people here think that PR is uh, healthcare? Wow, you guys, it is. It is. We had one hand up over there. It is. How many people think PR is, you know, celebrity, media PR? It's okay, it's a safe space. I see some over here. All right, for those of you over here who are not raising your hands at all, so maybe, are you in the right, con this is the PR conference, are you in the right conference? <laughs> Anybody, y'all, <laughs> nobody's raising their hand. How many people think that PR is in every single thing any enterprise that is making money does? Thank you. Much better. Thank right. you. Thank you, this side of the room. <laughs> I was gonna say, can we, Megan, can we take a break? I need these people over here. To, they they're the wrong conference, they're the wrong conference. But the point is, it's in everything, so, Shouldn't we be recruiting, given that we touch everything, right? So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Right, thank you guys. So if, if diversity is going to succeed, it needs to be supported from the top, right? Um, meaning leadership, just to be very clear and, and poignant on that. How has leadership supported <coughs> racial diversity in our industry? So just, um, you guys are at a PRSA Tri-State Conference, right? So PRSA is an entity, is an association, um, has a diversity and inclusion council. Um, I was chair of that several years ago. No surprise that diversity is something I'm passionate about. But we realized we had an issue, right? And we still have an issue, as Amelia said, we still have the issue. So PRSA um, has done a number of things. And this year, uh, we sponsor Diversity Mixer every year at our conference. Um, we have diversity awards for chapters who showcase and highlight the diversity practices that they're doing. But really, um, you know, PRSA as an association kind of looks at how can we recruit students via PRSSA, the student shout out to NYU PRSSA chapter. Um, how can we use the students or how can we go to historically black colleges and recruit? How can we go to Hispanic colleges and recruit, and recruit to get the students involved in PRSSA to then transition into PRSA. So I do think, if I just look at leadership, industry leadership, leadership is very different in each of wherever you work, where we work, leadership is different. But from an industry leadership standpoint, PRSA is doing some amazing things around diversity and inclusion. Yeah, and I will add to what Brandy just said. 
we as an industry and PRSA um, and other organizations like Colorcom and HPRA, we still need you to get involved. We need active involvement from those, and it's not just those of diverse or of color, but we need our white male counterparts, our LGBTQ counterparts to join us in this effort. Um, I wanted to just mention really quick a little bit from an industry perspective, what agencies are doing. Recently, Angela Chikara from City of New York College did a survey and research report for Holmes Report and PRSA, and she interviewed 17 CEOs of the largest PR agencies. And you can tell from that report, and you can get it if you go to Holmes Report, um, that the leaders in our industry, the CEOs, they are passionate about this topic, but they also agree that we're stuck. So I think we've at least met that first step. They recognize that it's important and it's a business imperative, but they also realize that we've been talking about it for years and we really haven't moved the needle. So I think we have leadership buy-in. It's what's next. Yeah, so I'll speak um, maybe more specifically to change.org. Um, my team in particular is pretty diverse. Uh, my lovely boss is right here in front of me right now. Uh, Ooh, we're one of two. Uh, Give AJ a ring. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, we are, I'm one of two of our North American communications team. Um, our overall campaign team is pretty diverse. Um, women, people of color, um, I'm a black gay man, my boss is a black, um, is a black queer woman. You know, we have, we have diversity on our specific team, so that's been good. Um, I think as a company, for a few years, we were doing diverse, I'm on the diversity and inclusion team also. Um, but for a while, those conversations were really, you know, internal. So yes, we had HR people on it, recruiting people on it people like myself and other colleagues. Um, but what we kept saying was like, well, this is good that we're talking about this, that we have these sessions, these groups, these initiatives, but we really need this to be something that's like front and center for the company. Um, and we kept saying that, and luckily, I mean, maybe just the space that we're in at change.org where we're all kind of, we all gravitate towards social issues. So I, I recognize like that that's specific to us. Um, but basically our leadership said, yeah, we do want to make this a big deal. Um, so what they've done is our COO is a part of the conversations when we we are having talking about diversity and inclusion. When Hushunda came on board last year, our HR team and recruiting team, they came to me, came to our team and said, what are you looking for in terms of a new director of communications? Um, and that boiled down to like writing, a, helping with the job description, interviewing her and asking like, can I work with this person? And can we have the conversations that will be tough, that will make my job not really emotional, like t emotionally taxing? Um, we also have instituted a space where we have an all team call every week um, in our company, uh, but now we have a one, um, one call a month where it's like a staff board call, um, where the diversity includes questions are brought up um, and if I mean we're actually pretty blunt we're not perfect I will say that we we've got a long ways to go but we have questions that are just very pointed like hey why are there just white men working in leadership can someone give us an answer to that and then our CEO and our like our leadership they have to give an account for it. Um, so what we found is that the more it's in the center of the company and a part of the conversation, um, it really does sort of drive the conversation forward. Uh, one other thing we've done is participate in a diversity and inclusion challenge um, in the last year, where our HR team said, hey, like we want to be really intentional about making sure that our the team that has like the most that doesn't have people from an underrepresented community, that we actually make an effort to do that. So for us, it's our product team in San Francisco. It's mainly white, mainly male. Um, and so what they said was, we're gonna make sure that this huge amount of percentage of people that we look for, that we interview, that come on Cypher interviews, are from underrepresented communities. Now that hasn't always panned out in terms of making sure that like the person who's hired um, is, is an African American or a person of color, LGBT, but what it does do, it makes, that, makes them do the hard work in conversation with us. So when you're talking about like recruiting at, you know, thinking about like colleges and universities, if you're a recruitment team where you're just used to thinking, you know, looking anywhere, once you say we're gonna try to make this 60%, well, then you gotta think, that, well, where are these people? They're HBCUs. They're in parts of the country where maybe like they aren't in New York City or San Francisco. And so what does it mean to make people actually think through that like very concretely? Yeah, and if I can say, you know, at State Farm, one of my leads or, or charges is to ensure that every campaign we do has um, a culturally uh, sensitive or culturally uh, relevant 
aspect to the campaign. And some the, the thing that I have to do um, always is, and I, I feel like I shouldn't have to anymore, is remind our agencies that they need to have a diverse mix of employees or to represent us as a client, to pitch us, to talk about us, and to present that every proposal that is presented to us should have that cultural nuance in it. And so for those of you in agencies, your clients are demanding this now. And this is really important. Uh, I wanna see that. And if I don't see it, I'm already turned off. I'm already upset about the proposal or the pitch. And I'm like, okay, why? Why didn't you bring it to us this way? Um, what were you thinking? Or who are the voices in your room that are counseling you about our pitch? So that's also really important. Exactly, and you guys were really hitting on recruiting, you know, the job description, mm -hmm. making sure it's all aligned. Speak a little bit more about those recruiting strategies, like what's working in our industry, what's not working, and what more can be done? Well, I know, and Brenda, you would probably speak to this from your PRSA work, but I know the foundation is really working hard, the PRSA foundation, to reach out to high schools. We are now, um, the PRSA, PRSA Foundation is actually receives donations, and we actually provide scholarships for students to attend conferences. Um, you know, we have, we really push the mentorship. So for those of you in PR SSA, get involved, be a voice. Does your SSA chapter have a diversity chair? Why not, if it doesn't? Um, it doesn't just have to be at the PRSA level, it should start at the PRSSA level. So that's the other thing that the um, PRSA National and the foundation is really pushing so that it doesn't just start once we're already in the workforce, it starts before. And I know for Austin, I'm in the PRSA Austin chapter, one of the things that we wanted to do is reach out to middle school and high school students that are really just don't understand the industry, don't know what the opportunity is, but also show them there are people that look like them in the industry. Yeah, and just to add, so I don't want you guys to think, oh my gosh, they've talked about PRSA. We are at a PRSA conference. Um, <laughs> but not all PRSA, for those of you who might not even be a member, hopefully after today you will be a member of PRSA. Um, New York, Connecticut, Westchester, Holler. Um, whoever, however, but let's go a step broader, just kind of just in your just overall company with, you know, recruiting or where you may work. So um, IBM is in 170 countries, right? 170, that's a lot. And I just got on a team where I'm responsible for our global markets, which is a lot of countries. Um, so you look at recruiting, not just you know, race and, and, and ethnicity, but culturally, right? And how we recruit um, culturally, you know, how do we show up? How does IBM show up in other countries? Um, I can tell you we have kind of a twofold issue with diversity, um, I'm saying another issue, concern that we try to hit. It's not just the diversity in our PR and marketing function, but it's also in technology as a whole. So let's take a poll here. Who saw Hidden Figures, the movie? Yay, right, a, lot of you. a lot of people saw it. Do you guys like it? Yeah. Okay, those of you who didn't raise your hand, something is going over here with this side of the room. <laughs> Did you guys not have coffee? Something is up over here. Um, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, you should see the movie. It's an amazing movie. I'm not going to give anything away. But IBM, or the IBM in the movie, um, you know, kind of came up and it was just... I didn't even know this story. I've been worked in IBM, you know, eight years. I didn't even know, you know, the whole NASA. I knew that NASA was a client of ours and has been for a very long time. I didn't know the story. Um, seeing hidden figures, very, very inspirational and just kind of passionate to what I'm doing. Looking at technology and working at a technology company, if I look at, again, uh, just race and ethnicity and then just kind of culturally, 18% of African Americans graduate um, in the US with a computer science degree. However, if you look at the Googles, the Microsofts, you know, the Twitters, only 5% work at those companies. So me and my team are like, well, where's the 13%? And it's almost like become like a joke. We're like, where's the 13%? Like, where is everybody? Can't find we're, it. Exactly, we're trying to figure out like what happened with that drop off. But then as I look at some of the countries, diversity and inclusion in Japan does not exist. And for those of you who are from Japan, holler, raise up, thank you. That is not a term that you hear in Japan, right? <clears throat> Diversity and inclusion means something completely different. So you have to look at how are you recruiting culturally to get different just backgrounds in general into PR, into your organization, 
by being very, very inclusive and understanding culturally that what we're saying in the US might not translate in, an, in another country. So again, I think that's kind of like twofold. We have the race and ethnicity, we have the culture. So how do you make PR attractive whether you're in China, whether you're in California, whether you're in Latin America, how do we make it overall attractive for people to want to even be in PR at all? Right. And yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, um, specific for change, um, and not just with PR, but across the company, um, crowdsourcing actually works sometimes. So they will say, hey, there's this job posting. Please, like, send this out to your different networks. So they realize in the ways of, like, they can be limited in doing that. Um, I think, and you all have heard this, I'm kind of on a let people work remotely kick, because um, I actually have been able to do that. My boyfriend lives in North Carolina, so I'm back and forth between Durham and New York a lot. Um, but I think there's something to say about, um, actually, and our teams have done this, letting people live where they live. Um, quite frankly, New York City, San Francisco, are really expensive places. And there are a lot of people in between California and New York, New York, who are probably really badass PR professionals or good like for the company, Austin. like in Austin, Texas, right? Who may for various reasons not want to move to such a city like that. I mean, maybe you're a mom or dad with three kids and you're a single parent. Do you want to leave a cozy home in Nebraska to move to New York City and like schluck it along the city you know, as you're trying to be your PR badass self? Maybe not, right? Um, and the reality too, I think, is that historically, um, and this is not, by no means monolithic, like people of color um, have had to suffer um, you know, throughout history. So when you think about people who have like passed down generational wealth and like how, who gets generational wealth? Who can take a free internship in New York City for a summer, right? Who can just study abroad for no, I mean, I was really fortunate to be able to do those things in college, right? But my mother, she was the first in her family to go to college. I had other friends who did not have those options, right? Like they legitimately had to work during the summer to make enough for, to like survive through the semester, right? So I guess I'm saying like, now that I'm paying back graduate student loans and it's like not very fun, I'm aware of the fact there are people who actually have twice as many loans as I do, three times, who are just like, I would love to live in New York and do PR. I cannot afford that. Literally, I can't do that. So can we open it so they can work remotely and do virtual meetings while living in whatever place they decide and they come up to the cities that are far more expensive? Like, is that a way forward in this very tech-savvy age that we're in? Well, and I just want to tag on to what you said because, you know, if you want, if you are with a client or a, an industry that allows for that virtual workforce, then I'll charge you with, when you have a position, don't go to the, the same schools that you always go to. Mm -hmm. Break down okay. the barrier of entry by going to those schools that maybe don't have a great representation. Maybe it's a school in Ohio, maybe it's a school in Texas um, or Arizona. Even though you're a New York-based firm or uh, business, why can't you bring someone? Because not only may you find great uh, insight from someone who's in another part of the country, because geography is also a diversity issue, right, right. big time from here exactly. as well, yeah, yeah. but also you know, brings that perspective. Um, I know that being in Austin, so I am technically also a virtual, off, you know, virtual employee, but I have an office in Austin, and a lot of times the conversation, because our headquarters is in Bloomington, Illinois. It's a small farming town huge headquarters, but I see things and hear things, especially as a tax tech, tech savvy town in, in Austin, that folks in Bloomington have never heard of, or I'm first to the door. And I've always said that this is the advantage I bring to the table, is that I live in a very diverse city, I live in a very diverse state, I hear things that are happening um, in the news in my own state with our own governor and his bathroom bill issue. <laughs> I'm from um, North Carolina, don't feel bad about it. Yeah. So, you know, th I think that's the other part of diversity that I can bring to the table. And so consider that when you're hiring, for those of you who have the ability to, you know, involve your hiring team, don't just look at color or gender, but also geographic diversity. Like, where mm -hmm. are we looking right. for these people to come in? Right, right. Exactly. And the other equation... Uh, part of the equation to diversity is inclusion, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So can you guys speak to a little bit of the inclusion strategies? What's working? What's, what are some of the barriers? Yeah. What sure. else can be done? Do you so, want to go? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So diversity and inclusion, d and as we say, you can't have diversity without inclusion because exactly. you have to include everybody. So a couple of things, again, I, uh, I sit on IBM's Marketing and Communications Diversity and Inclusion Council. Um, there was a quote that I heard once that says, we can't achieve harmony if we're all singing the same note. 
which is true. Imagine if this whole room, we all just hit one note, we probably, some cats would probably be screaming like outside <laughs> if we were all just on that one note. So you have to be inclusive of every, you know, every person, every idea, every perspective in your work environment. I hate to tell everybody, but this started long before you got to work. Everybody remember like in kindergarten, like the boys in kindergarten that would like push you down for the girls because they like liked you, but they would like, cause boys are like, rough and gross and sometimes silly when they're in kindergarten so they'll like push you down we had to learn how to play there was no oh my god i have like a black friend or like at that age that kids don't do that right so the teacher had to be inclusive to make sure like all the kids we've been practicing inclusion even if you're not aware of it since we were children and then as we've gotten older and we get into college we're sitting in class Who's had like a group project that they've had to do and there's always that one person in your group who never does the work? Who has There's always a There's slacker. always that one always where that you one have person. to like make up. Does it matter what race they are? No, you have a grade that you have to get. So you have to do work as a team to be inclusive. I will just say just again with as passionate as I am about diversity and inclusion, because again, I can't do one without, I'm not like, well, I'm just doing all this for diversity, for good inclusion. It's all one thing. I, cannot, I, I can't stress this enough to everybody here, to your companies, all of you as individuals, it is so important for you to show up at class, at work, wherever you are, as your authentic self. If you can't go to work, if you can't go to school, if you can't go, even in family situations, and I know it's tough because we love our family, but we want to kill them at the same time. I trust me, my uncle Frank, I totally understand. So inappropriate at holidays, so inappropriate. But you want to show up as your authentic self. No one in this room should have to go somewhere pretending to be someone or something that they are not. Right? And not be inclusive, oh, because I'm this, oh, because, forget about the label. Not being included, not being inclusive because you're not your authentic self. That's a horrible way to live and no one should do that. So as we look at what can we do, Amelia's already said, we need your help. We need to move the needle forward. Please remain true to your authentic self. Please, please. Oh. Can I? Yeah. Okay. We're fighting. <laughs> I'll piggyback off of this one. Uh, I actually really love the inclusion question because um, I think there are tons of resources and ways to make sure that people feel empowered, um, hopefully in their companies or respective fields. Uh, but I actually think it's not always. It's that's it, this is a good question, and it is important for me to you know be my true self. But I think the other side, and maybe the thing that's at the deeper root of the problem, isn't how I'm going to flourish in a space, right? It's not like how I, AJ can be me and for all the things that I am, right? But the better question is, what is it about those that in, there are in the majority that make those spaces inhospitable for people to be their true selves, right? I mean, I feel like, I mean, I'm looking and seeing lots of pe different types of people here. Amongst your friends, you probably know how to be your true self, right? But that may change actually when, and no offense to our my white straight males in the audience, but like, we all know that most people are concerned about how they have to sort of, what they can say in those spaces, what they can do, how they're perceived, right? So part of it is actually working with those who are in the majority to think through their own biases, like how they've been formed, how they've been shaped. Like why is it that like a group of people may see the one person of color as like, you know, um, one representing the many? Like how does that happen? That just, just doesn't happen, right? Um, and so I think what we're trying to do, um, at least at Change right now, is think, of course, through unconscious bias trainings, right? And so with our product development team, um, they've actually done several trainings over the last um, year. Um, and now we're planning on making that a part of the whole company and making that part of like onboarding for staff members. So that from the moment you become a part of change.org, you're automatically thinking, through, what are my biases? And I have them too. We all have them no matter like, where you come from, right? Um, and we're also looking at how to do an inclusive survey. Uh, I mean, working on an inclusive survey, so we can actually ask our teams, what is it, how do you feel? What does it mean to like be, feel included in this company? How do we sort of figure it out at the beginning, and then how do we measure improvement, right? Because again, um, you may sometime want to be like your true self in these environments, but we all know there are, there are consequences for that sometimes. I, and I, that's, I, yeah, I disagree yeah. that there are consequences yeah. for being your true <laughs> yeah. self because if I can't be Brandy, I don't know who else to be, okay? I cannot be Jennifer, I cannot be Michelle, I don't, I don't know those girls, I'm Brandy. That's all I know how to be. If I can't be me and all of this fabulous glory that you see here, <laughs> 
then that's not the place for me to be. I am not going to wake up and go somewhere where I can't be me. If that's a consequence, if I'm out of a job, guess what? Starbucks is always hiring. I make a mean <laughs> I, no, so Brandi, latte. I, I think that's... So I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have to be me. I, think I that's, cannot uh, not yeah. be me. If you are in a situation where you're not, then I'm here to tell you you're in the wrong place. But I think that's in the wrong place. I value that, and my boss is here to vouch. I'm probably a little to me sometimes, right? So I, I definitely <laughs> see that. But I do think the emotional labor for this cannot be on the minorities in these situations, right? right? So like, let me, yeah, let me yeah, jump in, jump okay. in. I'm gonna interject in the middle here. Well, and I think <laughs> be, you yourself. Be, be yourself. Be yourself. Don't, don't change. Yourself, everybody. Be but other people need to change don't work too. For me, be <laughs> Well, and, and you know, I work at a very conservative <laughs> company and we're very risk adverse. So having these really authentic conversations isn't maybe always, you know, the first thing in mind, right? And I know for a lot of the women in the room, you've probably been when you're assertive, and you're strong, you've been told you're too aggressive. Okay, so my, my point here is we need to stop having these discussions amongst ourselves. We've insulated ourselves. We have... It's a great recommendation um, to have an affinity group, an e ERG, an employee resource mm -hmm. group, to really get that insight. But don't become an echo chamber. You have to speak, and this is what the inclusion aspect really is. It's bringing our white brethren to the table and asking them and then telling them, you know what, why did you feel that that comment was aggressive? Um, my intention was X, Y, Z. How can I communicate that to you in an assertive way that doesn't make you feel uncomfortable? Right. And I think that's really important. We have to make sure that those that maybe don't embrace diversity or don't feel that they are the, the voice of diversity, but they also feel included in the conversation. And some of your best sponsors are going to be those white male executives. How many here have, have a sponsor who is a white male who has helped bring you up through the line? Come on, really? Okay, great, wow. very few. Usually it's a larger crowd, but I think that's the conversation, is how do we make people feel comfortable? How do we not become our own echo chamber and insular, but actually include people right. in the conversation? And this is gonna go, because recruitment efforts are great. Having a strategic plan and a business imperative, mm -hmm. that's great. You get everybody in the door, you've reached out to HBCs and you know those odd schools way out in Texas or whatever, right? <laughs> okay, but how do you retain that talent? and then move them up the pipeline. And the only way to do that is to ha create and pro like nurture an inclusive environment at your place of work. I just wanna add, I agree wholeheartedly with what Amelia is saying. Going back to the culture, again, I'm responsible for a global markets team. Um, I have a lot of colleagues from India. I have a lot of colleagues um, from, I call ASEAN, Singapore, Malaysia. I am a hugger. Anybody who knows me knows we, Amelia yes. and I were like hugging in the bathroom. <laughs> April and I, like, I am a hugger. Anybody, I'm Southern, right? If you're from the South, it's just like a stranger is a friend you haven't met yet. So like everybody's like a friend. And I kiss on the cheek because I'm a Latina. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm literally like in your grill. That's just me, I don't know what right? I do. My Indian colleagues come to visit. They come to New York quite frequently. And shout out to anybody, all the, you know, anybody from India, shout out to you in the house. And I see them and they go to extend their hand. Hi, Brandy. And I like tackle them just because I'm so excited to see them. The flight to India, dear Lord, is long. Right. <laughs> I feel bad that they had to like travel all this way. And I hug them. I'm not trying to make them feel uncomfortable. But if anybody has any colleagues or worked or friends who are in, that makes them very uncomfortable that I am like, on them, right? So I have to, going kind of to the unconscious bias, mm -hmm. I have to take that culturally where you want to hug all of them and kiss them, and that is just not acceptable behavior in, culturally. Not, again, am I not being inclusive? No. I need to be aware of my unconscious bias that I just can't go around hugging everybody. Now look, I'll give all you free hugs in here. I'm just a hugger, but if that's not something that you're comfortable with, I have to know that. So again, we're talking about race and ethnicity, but I, I just can't stress culture enough just because I encounter it every single day. So I was trying to think, Adrian. this may be a horrible analogy, so I'll apologize now. Um, so I think you're right. I mean, Amelia, to your point, um, yeah, I think these conversations can't be had, like they can't be siloed. It takes 
all of us being at the table together. Um, again, I, I, I'm, I do think that oftentimes, like I said earlier, the emotional labor of working out, like when, it, when we talk about inclusion and diversity, tends to fall on people who are already having to navigate that every day. And I just don't think that's like fair, right? So here we go. My boyfriend is hosting uh, a colleague from Brazil, right? Um, she speaks Portuguese, I speak no Portuguese. Um, she, sp she speaks English, she speaks it very slowly, right? And we spend a lot of time with her um, and have a lot of conversations. Now, I want to know her, she's a great person, right? And if I think that, I, if I'm saying that I actually want to know her, I actually have to change when I'm talking to her the pace of how I talk. Right. I can't talk fast like this, or I eliminate her from a conversation, right? I talk slowly, I use words, and I have to explain things that I wouldn't normally have to do. And she's doing it too, but she, I mean, my God, if I'm tired, she's like twice as tired, right? So I guess I think about, think about that in terms of like conversations around like diversity and inclusion. Like I think we should all be at the table, but again, it shouldn't, shouldn't just be the four of us feeling like the right. burden of like, gosh, how can I understand them? No, but I feel like if, if our people in leadership say they care about it, they should almost feel the kind of like effort that I have to put forth with this Portuguese friend of ours. This to sort of, to feel the, the burden of like having to slow down, to think about what I'm saying and doing. We're both sharing that in the moment because at the end, me and this friend, like we want to, we want to get to know her better. And if that's the case for racial diversity and inclusion, like I think it's just gonna take some really tough yes. conversations, a lot of self-reflecting, and it's not gonna be pretty all the time, and it's gonna be messy, but at the end goal is actually having a world, that a space that reflects our world, right. we gotta to commit to a long term. Exactly, and just to wrap it up, I know yeah. we we're running low on time, I do Sorry. wanna kinda of cap it off <laughs> with one of, like one of my last questions for you guys. What advice would you give to someone who wants to be an advocate for minority talent, but doesn't know where to start? Come talk to me. That's the best, come talk to me. We can do this together. I cannot do everything alone. We, were, we laughed, April, I'm doing a lot of things, yes, but I can't do it alone. I am a huge champion for diversity. You read my rap sheet. Come talk to me. You see how passionate I am about being your authentic self because I don't want anybody to be somebody else that is exhausting to do that. So if you are passionate about diversity, if you're passionate about cultural diversity as well as race, come talk to me. Find me. Google. I am very Googleable. Google me. <laughs> she is. Add me. Come talk. Let's have. Let's sit down. How are we going to help move the needle with this problem? So I'm going to turn the turn the tide a little bit and say step up. Um, it can't be four, five, six of us that always have the torch and we're constantly the torch bearer. I mean, I have walked in a room and they're like, oh, there's Amelia. She's going to bring in the diversity conversation. <laughs> right, right. With the campaign, you know, do this or that. Do we have color in our slides? And I, I get a little frustrated. <laughs> color in it's, our It's there. It's slides. true. You become the person who's like, always raise your hand. Take but it to this. another Wait level. Second. Amelia Is speaks Spanish. Color she in does the all the slot. Latino stuff. Okay. So... You know, step up, and you don't have to be of color. Uh, we need people who have diverse backgrounds, the disabled community, the yes. veteran community, yep. the women, the men. Really step up and help and say, you know what? I'm really interested in this diversity and inclusion conversation. What can I do at my organization or as a PRSA member or IABC or ColorCom or whoever your organization is? What can in Society of Engineers or whatever what can I do to make sure we have an inclusive and diverse voice at the table? Yeah, not much else to add to that. I mean, I, I love that. Um, but yeah, I think if you are not a minority or from an underrepresented community, be an ally, you know? You know it's, as she said, like, don't force the other. If you're, if you're asking yourself about a question about race or gender, don't let it be the woman that has to raise her hand every single time. Raise that question. <laughs> That's really important. Um, and to your point, too, um, you know, I actually raised my hand and changed. I was like, hey, I want to be a part of this diversity and inclusion conversation. And they said, hey, do you want to lead this diversity and inclusion challenge? And my first thought was, oh, shit, I don't want to do that. But I actually do want to do that. And so it's part <laughs> of just saying, yes, like, I'm going, if, I'm, if I want the conversation to change, if I want things to change, I've got to do some of the, I mean, the extra work to sort of see it happen with and among lots of different types of people. Thank you guys Thank you so all. much.